Welcome back, everyone. Well, we are continuing our in-depth look here at mental illness as it pertains to inmates and as what is going on, as we just heard a very interesting conversation at Rikers Island here, especially what's happening between the correction officers and those inmates. And the population at Rikers is shrinking overall, but the population of the mentally ill is growing. And I want to uh, bring in our, our panel right now, um, including... Um, uh, right now over the phone, uh, we are joined uh, by um, Dr. Bandy Lee uh, via Skype, I should say, and she's an assistant clinical professor in the law and psychiatry division at the University in New Haven. She also serves as a staff psychiatrist at Rikers between 2007 and 2008. Um, first of all, doctor, thank you for joining us. And secondly, um, you read the time series. Uh, we spoke earlier Everything you heard and everything that you read in that series, um, did it echo some of your same experiences? Absolutely. The, I, I was very concerned during my stay there that um, some of the brutality that was being described in the Times articles was occurring even during my stay um, as a clinical psychiatrist. There was not enough proof to say what was going on, but now the objective evidence is revealing and confirming what I have seen. Mr. Seabrook made the point, which is, if the guards don't use excessive force here, they're not only at risk, uh, but uh, the entire uh, system there is put in peril. Is the level of force that we've seen, and we've gone through some of the documentation of the 129 inmates um, that reached that threshold, plus you can speak from first-hand experience, is the level of force used necessary to keep order in prison? Absolutely not. I think actually that is the problem. There is a subculture and um, a worldview, if you will, among the corrections officers that all is against all and force is the way to get matters under control. In fact, force is one of the reasons why violence continues to escalate in situations where um, some far less intrusive uh, intervention may have placed the situation under control. There are many situations that I've seen, for instance, where um, an inmate uh, was having a psychiatric episode and the guards first re response is to show up with combat gear and mace. And that is how they often respond to situations they cannot understand. And as you pointed out, given the number of, increasing number of mentally ill inmates, such situations where the guards do not know what to do um, augment. And given their worldview, their first response will be force. And that is exactly not the way to handle most situations. Uh, Dr. Lee, I, I really do appreciate uh, a couple minutes with us. Thank you uh, so much. And, and I want to bring in our panel right now uh, to talk about, especially the interview we just heard with Mr. Seabrook. We're joined by uh, Scott Vanderhoff, um, attorney, former Rockland County Executive, Dominic Carter, who you saw earlier, um, and Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent. Listen, um, we all have done different versions of stories at different facilities, including maximum security facilities. Remember, this is a jail here. It's got some um, very bad people in it, but it's a jail. I, I, being a CO is a tough gig, but I had a hard time at the end of the conversation distinguishing where's the line between inmate and correction officer. Um, and there's got to be a difference between the two, right? I mean... If we're just saying, you know, an eye for an eye here as far as we go, I know for a fact that's not the case at every single facility. I mean, some of them weren't under your direct jurisdiction, but they were still in, in your region. I mean, you have facilities as well. What did you think about what you heard? Well, let, I'm disturbed by parts of it. Let, let, let me say this. Correction officers, by and large, are the most undervalued of all employees in government. 
People don't want to hear about the jails. They don't care. Once they're locked up, they don't care. And correctional officers themselves, in my view, and, and certainly in Rockland County, have always felt that they've never been appreciated for taking on the violent people who are in these jails. Now, you have to establish that yep. at first. So you have an immediate need, I think, to recognize the horrible job, the difficult job they have. That being said, if we get down to I, you know, eye for an eye, which it sounded like Mr. Seabrook was arguing for, although you, you, you tried to say, is that what you mean? He'd say no, but he kept saying, if they're going to attack us, if they're going to attack us. The evidence of these several cases was they were not being under attack. And the question then becomes, are these, and, and the whole idea of this, uh, taking somebody to a hospital and not getting f there for four hours, what happens to that? And I hope Mr. Seabrook goes back and investigates that because to me, that's, that's putting a person's life in, in jeopardy. Point is that you can't have an eye for an eye in jails. The correction officers do deserve respect, but they've got to abide by the law. They are the law. They are the law in these jails. And this article is very disturbing. And I think Mr. Seabrook would do better in trying to say, look, we should out any of those correction officers who are brutal beyond the required was means. Part of the union is to stand up for your own. I get it. And you know what? He's a terrific advocate. But when you protect all, then all get blamed if they're all put under this. Remember the story about the guy who literally cooked to death? The idea that that CO who could, wouldn't get up to go see the inmate, or at least as the allegation flows, should be defended. Or the idea, Batista's a five foot five inch guy who just tried to kill himself by hanging himself with his underwear. The idea that he gets tuned up so bad that he's got a perforated uh, liver or whatever, and then he's, he gets bus therapy even though there's a denial to that, but doesn't get to the hospital till four, I think it's more than four hours later, that's not acceptable. And that's not what the majority of the CEOs should be put in that same category. We've done stories like this before, Andrew, where you got a few bad apples, and then somehow if they all get defended in the same way, they all get labeled the same way. This is not healthy, and my God, the idea that this is somehow, you know, part of what happens when a guy goes in for a misdemeanor because he can't make a $250 bail payment, what are we talking about? Well, I, I think we would benefit from a, a little perspective or a little more perspective in all this. We're talking about 11,000 inmates and 120, 140 cases uh, where they claim that they were attacked by corrections officers or that they were uh, beaten by corrections officers. And, and very few people know what goes on inside Rikers or inside any correctional facility. So finding a way to put more sunshine on the situation I think would benefit everybody. By the way, that, that wasn't what... That came out from an independent undercover investigative report. Okay. That wasn't just the allegations from the inmates. These are ones that are corroborated by the report here, and they have chapter in verse. I mean, it, this is not I, some, I understand, but oh, I also on saw, the one but hand, saw, on the other. But I also saw the numbers were 11,000 people are in Rikers Island, and there are 100-plus incidents in the course of a year. So, you know, it may not be as rampant uh, or as widespread, it, it, to say that it's it, hard to distinguish a corrections officer from an inmate no, may no, no, be a, dis the, the may point be a is, disservice to no, that No, but that's not where, if we get to the point where we defend everything, where everything is excusable, um, and I'm still waiting for any of the actions to be condemned here across the board, if everything's excused, then you tell me where the line starts and stops. I'm not saying yeah. to, I'm not excusing anything. Yeah. I'm saying that these things tend and, to go on a case by a case basis. That's under investigation, if I recall from the article. But one thing I want to mention that I thought Mr. Seabrook was right on, and that may get to the heart of the issue, which is mental health. What do you do yeah. with those that have an illness of mental health? We as a society do not do this well. We don't know how to handle them. We don't know what to do them. It's not a science, and to throw them in with pr into jail situations. Uh, is a terribly difficult thing that society generally, I think, needs to deal with. More than th almost 40% of the population at Rikers now, Dominic, ca falls under this heading of mental illness. And it's not fair to the, to the system. It's not fair to the correction officers. It's not fair to the prison population. They are overwhelmingly on a percentage basis the most preyed upon victims in prison. But the idea of taking somebody that's mentally ill sticking them in isolation for 23 hours and expecting that somehow that's going to take care of itself, um, I, it's the definition of a recipe for disaster. Richard, every couple of years you hear, and I'm not wishing this, but you hear Rikers is about to explode. Every five, ten years. I think we're at that point right now. 
Um, let's let's understand. I agree with everything that you said. Um, it's a very tough place to begin with, to begin with, and. I mean, I'm, I'm not justifying the violence by officers by any means. We have laws. Laws have to be respected. They are the officers. But what, what gets them so infuriated is when the inmates, if you will, throw these cocktails that sure. consist of yep. urine, human waste, and blood, and that sometimes it ends up in your mouth. And Mr. Seabrook did say that he doesn't want any bad apples, you know, in, in his department. But it was a, a, a blanket... Uh, um, I just would say one thing, and, and we've, over the years on this program, gotten to deal with a lot of folks in the correction um, world, uh, including at maximum security facilities. They will all tell you, at the end of the day, there's not enough staff to deal with the prison population. The only way that they can maintain control and order in that place isn't through the end of a baton, because the math doesn't end up on their side. There has to be an expectation that there will be justice behind walls as much as you're going to find it. This is not nirvana. I'm not trying to paint this with some idealistic rose, but I am talking to people who do this for a living. And the idea here that you're going to tune up everybody that runs their mouth and that's somehow going to work in this place, now that you're introducing mentally ill people, it doesn't work. And, and, and I think you're right. Got to be real careful where this thing goes from here. All right. Um, when we come back, we're going to be talking about an issue that's got a clock on it, and that is about the transit potential strike here when it relates to the LIRR. The MTA goes another day without a deal, and commuters, they are bracing for the worst. We will have a look at the impact that the looming strike could have on businesses all across the region.